So now we get down to real business. Yep. So our topic today is going to be about game, and we welcome our speaker, who was an expert in marketing research industry in um, the Midwest. This is the research director of the research and planning group, a consulting company based in Brentwood, uh, a lecturer at the graduate lecturer at Southern Illinois University at Hillsborough School of Business, and a aficionado in comic books and a video games girl. So please welcome speaker Sean Jordan. Thank you, Vu. You know, I've had the opportunity to know Vu as a student, um, as a colleague, and as a friend, and she is one of the best people. So let's also give a round of applause for Vu. Thank you. Okay, and let me flip over to my slide deck. <laughs> One of the tried and true tips for being good at public speaking is to begin your talk with something that's memorable, an unexpected joke or a startling image or maybe a fascinating fact of some sort. And you know, I've been racking my brain all week trying to think about how to start this talk off, but my mind keeps going back to something that I experienced, and it's actually something that's not very easy to talk about because it's so difficult to describe. So I want to really find a way to put you there so you can feel, as a member of the audience, what it was like. But um, I'm going to try... I'm going to try, uh, so bear with me, by just asking you to imagine for a moment. And you can close your eyes if it helps you. But I want you to imagine, because I really want you to conjure up what I'm going to describe. Okay, so you ready? I want you to imagine a store in a strip mall. <clears throat> like One of those stores like you'd find next to a Target or a Walmart. It's not terribly big. It's maybe comfortable for around 10 to 15 shoppers. But it's large enough that if you really wanted to get the place good and crowded, you could get about 75 to 100 people in that room, okay? Now, I want you to imagine 75 to 100 people in that room, okay? Now, I also want you to imagine that most of those people are teenage boys between the ages of 11 to 15. Not old enough to drive themselves to the store, not old enough to have any money to spend there, but old enough that their parents want them out of the house and they're happy for them to be in the store rather than... Uh, anywhere else, okay? There are a few girls there too, and some of them have been dragged along by their, uh, by their brothers, or they are um, comfortable enough in their femininity to be around a bunch of obnoxious teenage boys. Um, but most of the store is, and which I should mention at this point, is a video game store. Most of the store is filled with teenage boys who are obnoxious, they're socially inept, they're standing around, they're waiting their turn to participate in a video game tournament on what just happens to be a particularly hot summer day. Okay? Got all that in your mind? Now, I want you to imagine the smell. Okay? Take a moment. Take a moment. Okay. There we go. Now I can see the looks on some of your faces. And I'm guessing that derives from an actual experience that you might have had being around boys of this age and, or, or around people that play games. And I can tell you story, because, and I can remember that smell, because I've had this experience as well, because in that store that you're imagining, the person standing behind the counter that's running the store is me, okay? And let me just show you a picture. This is me, ten, about 10 years ago. That was me, and I was living the dream of being a video game store manager, at least it was kind of my dream, sort of. I, I actually lived a lot of dreams to their logical conclusion, and there are a lot of reasons why I stopped living this dream in particular. But no, it wasn't because of this video game tournament that I was just describing or that memorable smell, because that was actually one of the very successful days that we had at that store, because what we did was we got a bunch of kids together who were really passionate and excited about games. They were there to play Super Smash Brothers Melee, and they were having a great time. And even though they didn't spend a lot of money that day, it paid big dividends later on. We were a very successful store because of activities that we would do like this. But one of the things that was really exciting was seeing how excited they were about games, and not just about video games. Some of them had brought card games to play. Some of them were making up games with their friends, just stupid, impromptu kind of games that they would make up as they were standing in line. They were having fun. They were enjoying themselves. And... Um, you know, it was, it was interesting because so many of them had so many of these stereotypical things that you think about when you think about the word video gamer. You know, they, they were socially inept. Some of them really did have a problem with personal hygiene. Some of them were so obsessed with games that we in the store that worked there knew not to make eye contact with them because we didn't want to hear. 
We didn't want to hear about why Half-Life 2 was better than Halo, or why World of Warcraft should be called World of War Crack, or why Nintendo should stop making game consoles and just focus on making games instead. We would get to hear for hours about all of those topics. So, again, I can tell you about all this because I experienced it myself. These things were not stereotypes for me. They were part of my day-to-day -day reality. But these stories don't offer a complete picture of gamers or video gamers. And one of the things that I've been very interested in since I left this world is in trying to understand who really are the people that play video games and, and why. And let me start off by just showing you a few statistics. So there are a lot of myths about gaming. One of them is that gaming is a niche hobby. It's something that only a handful of people in our global population are interested in. Well, at least in the United States, two in three households game. This is a statistic that comes from the Entertainment Software Association. So two in three households game. And by gaming, I mean that they play video games, uh, PC or console or handheld video games. This statistic doesn't include people that just occasionally play a game or that play smartphone games or play tabletop games or casino games or card games or even that play sports. And sports are, believe it or not, another type of game. This is just people that play mostly video games. So another statistic. There's a myth that gaming is for teenage boys. Well, the ESA actually found that the average gamer is 35 years old. 31% of gamers are adult women. And only 18% of gamers are, under the, are boys that are under the age of 18. So that myth is definitely far from true. What about this idea that gaming is for reclusive misfits? Okay, this is something that we, we heard a lot in the story, especially when mothers would come in and they'd be hanging out with their, their boys like, oh, why do you want to be a gamer? You know, this, that's for people that live in their, their parents' basement. Maybe some of those kids were on their way to doing that. I don't know. But you know what? Two-thirds of parents play games with their children. It is not a reclusive activity at all. It's actually a very social activity. Half of hardcore gamers, as people that really describe themselves as being dedicated gamers, play games with others, whether that's locally or whether that's online. Well, there's another myth, and that myth is that gaming is an unhealthy lifestyle. And this one's actually a little bit harder to unpack because it really depends on what you mean by unhealthy. Now, as Vu mentioned, I'm a researcher, and as a researcher, I love to look at data, I love to look at scientific studies, and I love to try to understand what the facts are and what, what we can see through empirical evidence. And the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of research that's gone into video gaming that suggests that it is healthy and that it's also unhealthy. So let's begin by talking about some of the negative things that have been found through scientific research regarding gaming. Okay, the biggest topic where the most research has been done involves mental health. And let me be clear in saying that there have been some very high quality studies that show that video games fundamentally alter the brains and thought patterns of gamers. There have been studies that have shown that gamers uh, use different strategies for solving puzzles, that, gamers, uh, that people who frequent games uh, that have small and easily navigated areas tend to lose some of their spatial uh, ability that they might develop through their hippocampus. And um, there's also findings that playing violent games is correlated with a rise in aggression in players, although that rise in aggression is usually temporary. It's not something that lasts for a long time. And then there's something called internet gaming disorder. And I, I found this one really interesting because I found a study that was very detailed and descriptive. It had like nine or ten authors behind it, and it only had a sample size of three. So you know nine or ten authors with a sample size of three is going to be interesting. What it was was it was conducted with three members of the United States Marine Corps who had become compulsive, obsessive gamers to the point that after their 40-hour work week, they were playing 30 to 60 and even upwards of 60 hours of online games per week. And they were complaining of all of these different symptoms that they had, uh, including gaming-related insomnia and depression and things like that. And really, the only time that they ever seemed to be happy during the treatment was when they started talking about the games they were playing. Then they lit up and they were really excited. You know, it was interesting because I'm reading this study and I'm thinking, well, first of all, I worked at a store that was right outside Scott Air Force Base, so I was very aware of people that were getting deployed and uh, taking games with them, that it was their escape from all the things that they were doing during the day, but also the age group. Um, the stories that I was reading about this game-related insomnia and this disorder of wanting to play games so much really reminded me of a lot of people that I knew in college or when I was working at the game store that were in their 20s that just really liked to play games a lot. So I was a little less... Uh, sure about the quality of that particular study, but the problem is that when you see studies like that, you also see organizations like the World Health Organization 
that are targeting more broadly what they call a gaming disorder. That's an official clinical diagnosis for a mental health condition. And the idea here is that there's some evidence that suggests that there's a certain proportion of gamers who have addictive tendencies when they're playing games and they're unable to disengage themselves easily. And this becomes particularly problematic when those games have revenue models that are based around things like microtransactions or loot boxes. And those are both things that are designed to get people to spend more money. This group is also considered to be quite vulnerable to um, games that are what, what, you, what you call spreadsheet, spreadsheet generators. They're games that they don't really have a lot of fun things to do. They just involve doing the same repetitive actions over and over. And um, th this group tends to have a difficult time disengaging with those sorts of games. But, you know, even though the World Health Organization has issued a report about this and some guidance on this, it's actually still a very controversial topic among people that study gaming. And... One of the problems is that video game addiction, as it's defined, is actually quite symptomatic of many other mental health conditions that often go along with this thing that they call video game addiction. And a lot of the driving force for calling video game addiction a pathology actually comes from Asia, where it seems that the older generations are very concerned that a lot of children are, and teenagers are playing games more than they're studying. So it's a little hard to uh, take all that at face value. But beyond all that, let's think about the physical implications of gaming. So gaming, and, and this is true of many types of games, not just video games, but video games in particular, involve a lot of time spent sitting. And there have been a number of studies that suggest that sitting is adverse to good health. While these studies aren't generally specific to gaming, they can be generalized to it. If you're spending a lot of time in your day sitting, it's generally something that you should need to be doing less of, and you need to find more uh, opportunities to be active. Gamers are also not known for having great diets. And I haven't found an actual lot of research on the topic of gaming and dieting, but I, what I have found is there's a lot of anecdote about gamers talking about the things that they eat, especially when they're playing online role-playing games like World of Warcraft, where it's really hard to disengage to make a meal. What they do instead is they snack, they eat prepared foods, uh, things that are really high in salt and sugar and fat and, and calories, and not real good, uh, especially with that lifestyle with a lot of sitting. So it's pretty common knowledge that people who get a little too involved in gaming can develop serious health problems as a result of diet. And one study that I did find, it's actually more of a paper offering guidance, but it was from um, an esports league, and they were talking about all the things that they're doing for professional gamers, people that play games for a living. They, they get them into game houses, and they get them on a pretty regimented diet and lifestyle, uh, including making sure that they get enough sleep. So this is something that is well known about gaming, that you have to counter the negative effects if you want people to be healthy. There's also some social implications. And like, like I said, the science is kind of iffy on whether or not gaming can be directly correlated to antisocial behavior. And a lot of the research that I have seen focused on the topic of violent video games. And I want to mention, when you're talking about video games, there's always a selection bias because there are games that are very nonviolent, games like Tetris or um, uh, games like Katamari Damashi where you're rolling a ball around or things like that. And then there are games that are exceptionally violent. And the studies that are talking about violence tend to, tend to focus on those extremely violent games, whereas the studies that are looking for pro-social behaviors tend to focus on games that are a little bit less violent. So there's always bias in terms of the games that they pick. But it's not a stretch to suggest that video games can at the very least, tend to encourage behaviors which are antisocial. And when you think about this, the framework of a lot of video games is that you are the hero or the protagonist fighting an army of, of bad guys. And you might have a few teammates or people helping you, but for the most part, it's you versus the rest of the world. And even in uh, multiplayer games, a lot of those games wind up being competitive rather than cooperative. And what this tends to do is it tends to reinforce this idea to players that through the abstraction of their online persona, that they can be abusive towards other players with little social consequence. And this leads, in many games, to toxic communities that can form, and it, sometimes it even spills over into the real world. And if anybody remembers the whole Gamergate fiasco a few years ago, that is an externality of that. So there definitely are some negative effects that can happen with gaming. But you know what? I'm actually not here to talk about that today. What I'm actually here to talk about is this bigger question of whether or not games are unhealthy. In my, in my mind, games aren't unhealthy at all, because the whole idea of being unhealthy is a complete misnomer. Outside of things that are provably lethal, most things that we humans do as activities are fine in moderation, and they only become unhealthy when we, we do too much of them, when we become obsessed with them, when we do them all the time. For example, it's really good 
to drink water every day. It's a really, really great idea to drink water. But if you drink two gallons of water every day, you are going to die because you're going to probably drown yourself. It's really good to breathe oxygen. We all need to breathe oxygen to live. And the oxygen in the air around us is about 21% oxygen. If you decided to go on a steady diet of 100% oxygen, you would die. This is not something that you can live on sustainably, at least in Earth-like conditions. So it's important to understand that even things that are good for us can hurt us if we indulge in them too much, and gaming is no different. The idea of things being unhealthy just because they're pleasurable is a fallacy. It's the same fallacy that's been debated by humanity since people figured out that there was something more to life than just trying to subsist and try to avoid getting eaten by predators. Okay? Things that are fun, things that are interesting, things that capture our imagination are often derided by other people who don't enjoy them as much as we do. So, in other words, when I'm looking at a lot of the science, a lot of it smacks of this. I'm sure you guys have all seen this meme. Stop liking what I don't like. A lot of the science seems to be coming from a point of view of, I don't like gaming, so therefore I'm going to find all the things wrong with it. So the key is in understanding what healthy gaming might look like. And actually, there's a lot of science on that topic, too, believe it or not. Now, the first question that we need to ask is, if you're going to play games, and this is, this is true, again, of video games, it's true of board games, it's true of any kind of activity that is game-like, how long can I safely game in a day? This is a question that we need to ask. Because one of the things that really bothers people, particularly parents, is how often uh, people that they, they, they see gaming are spending engaged in that activity. And so I was thinking about this a lot. I haven't seen any actual scientific prescription for what the best optimal level of game time is. But what I will say, let's ask how often do most Americans watch TV? Does anybody know the answer? It's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking rhetorically. The answer is about four to five hours a day and sometimes upwards of five hours. Four hours of live TV and then another hour or two of uh, programmed TV. So my suggestion would be that it's probably all right to game that many hours a day. And that adds up pretty quickly. If you, if you game seven days a week, five hours, that's 35 hours a week. That's a lot of gaming. However, if people are already doing that and, and not having any problems with that with other activities, it's probably safe to do that with gaming as well. So that's good general advice. Now, I want to say, if you're spending most of your time during your day sitting and you're not getting a lot of exercise, you're not sleeping well, you're not satisfied with your uh, family or social relationships, you're not eating well, then you probably need to focus on those things first before you worry about how much time you should spend gaming. But if all those other things are in balance, I wouldn't worry about how much time you spend because the reality is, if your life is in balance, you only have a few hours in the day to do the things that you enjoy anyway, and you might as well spend, it, spend them doing what you like the best. But beyond that, let's talk about how games are actually healthy. So looking at the research, I found a really, really great meta-analysis from a, a psychological journal called Frontier. I've got a link up to it in the slides here that you can check out after the, uh, the talk. Video games have been found to do a lot of things. They've been found to contribute to emotional stability, reduce emotional disturbances in children, reduce stress and improve relaxation, improve mood and overall happiness, assist in the development of skill acquisition and condition players to receiving feedback when they need to get better at something, motivate players through structured goal setting, improve concentration and problem solving skills, provide players to a, a, a reason to find a purpose or meaning within the context of gameplay, provide an environment for building and maintaining positive relationships, even reducing loneliness, and, and this one's really interesting to me, distract from compulsive or addictive urges. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of moments. So it turns out gaming actually can be pretty positive. But one of the things that I do want to caution you about is that a lot of the studies that, that came up with these ideas were looking at games that were pretty popular and fairly benign. They were looking at things like Super Mario Brothers or Tetris or uh, World of Warcraft or Halo, games that are not like super violent or super competitive. And many of the claims that they assert about the benefits of the games are specific to those games. Many of the negative studies look at hyper-violent titles like Doom, Mortal Kombat, or Call of Duty, or games that have microtransactions or gambling-like mechanics. So you can't generalize every single positive about gaming to every single game. Much like anything you consume, it's a good idea to put yourself on a diet to ensure that you get the greatest benefits. And I would argue, based on my fairly extensive knowledge of gaming and on the literature I've read, that there are some types of games that are actually pretty good for you, okay? These include, there are games that involve exploration of an open world, preferably without a mini-map or overt wayfinding, because that interrupts your hippocampus functions to some degree. So if you have to explore the world on your own, that's really good. 
games that involve puzzle solving in 3D or in 2D, games that involve reflexive techniques through trial and error, and a, a very simple example of that would be a game like Pac-Man or Donkey Kong, where you just kind of learn to reflexively move. Games that promote learning, a new skill, language, or topic. Games that promote physical activity. Games that promote meaningful social, inter social interaction, particularly locally, like when you're sitting on the couch with other people and playing with them. Games that allow you to, uh, to apply creative or programming skills through modification or level design. And games that feature extremely strong narratives, which are artistically fulfilling to experience. These are all games that are, I would argue are good for you. And in fact, at the end of this slide deck, we'll be happy to email those out to anyone that would like them. I have made recommendations for all of these topics on games you can check out if you're really interested in trying some of them. What about games that are just okay to play from time to time? These are games that aren't bad for you, but they're not that great for you either. Well, that'd be games that have a strong linear focus or a boxed-in design. They require a significant amount of time to complete, but they don't really fulfill you that much. Games that are so complex that beginning them requires hours of tutorials to learn their myriad systems and nuances. It's just hard to get a lot of satisfaction from those kind of games. Games that are derivative of popular style and that only offer incremental improvements on the installment of a previous series. Or games that are brimming with collection activities and pointless side quests. And again, all of these games, they're just okay for you because they don't really engage you. They don't really help you. They don't really provide a lot of benefits that have been shown in the science. Stay away, from, though, from games that create cravings or anxiety that are best relieved through spending money. Those are generally agreed to be not the best for you. Games that feature a large amount of grinding for arbitrary rewards such as loot or trophies. Things that, you know, they're, they're digital rewards, but they're not really that useful. Games that are designed to be played for extended sessions but are difficult to disengage from, particularly if these games interfere with life balance or sleep. And this is a common problem with massively multiplayer games in particular, where there are social cues in those games that maybe can distract you from your real life because you have a hard time disengaging from what's going on in those games. Um, or games that focus on repetitive mechanical action, or games that create an extreme sense of frustration due to poor design, games that require a significant learning curve to master. Those are all games I would recommend staying away from, just because Based on the science that I've read, they're probably not that good for you. They're not helping you quite a, or that very much. Now, these are just general guidelines, of course. And I do want to mention that some of, some of the games that have been traditionally kind of considered not that great when they have shifted over to mobile platforms like smartphones or handhelds, they actually take on a different life because what was once frustrating or time-consuming in front of a TV becomes a lot easier when the controls have been rebalanced or when the game has been rethought for a more mobile experience. So there are times where games can be made healthier just by porting them to other platforms. But aside from the games you're playing, there are other ways to make games healthier too. And I'm going to recommend five hacks that you can use to make gaming a positive part of your life. Okay, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but... These are all hacks that I think are really beneficial, and I've used all of these in my own life. Hack number one is exercise while you game. Um, believe it or not, it is actually possible to play games and exercise. And I first stumbled upon this when I was a kid. I was at a gym at Scott Air Force Base, and I saw this stair-stepping machine that had a screen attached to it. And on the screen, there was a game. And the game involved flying around in some kind of aircraft, and shooting down flying pigs and hot air balloons and things like that. And the faster you went on the stair stepper, the faster your plane would go. And you had little buttons on your uh, hand grips that you could use as, uh, to, to shoot. It was amazing. And I saw kids, kids of all people, lining up to play this game, standing around talking about it, getting really excited about it, talking about the strategies they would use when they played it. And when you got on it, you weren't even thinking about the fact you were exercising. You were complaining when your turn was over. It was a really fun experience. Well, you can do that as well at home with the games that you already play. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to buy an exercise bike, especially an exercise bike that's either a recumbent style where you can sit on your couch and use it uh, easily, or one that has a desk on the top. And that's what I use at home. I can rest my, my hands and my controller on my desk and look at my TV and ride my bike for a half hour. If you're going to exercise while you're game, one recommendation I will make is play games that are active. Don't play games that have a lot of talking or that have a lot of story, because it, then you focus more on the exercise because you start to get bored. But if you're playing a game where you're just constantly hacking and slashing, Exercise is really easy to do, and you can even try stretching. You can try sitting on an exercise ball. There are all kinds of other exercises you can do. I would recommend avoiding treadmills. I've fallen off treadmills while gaming, and it's not a fun experience. Number two, use games as a form of meditation. So I, I have this technique that I use, and I call it my, my Luminesce meditation. Has anyone ever heard of the game Luminesce? Just a show of hands. Luminesce is a portable game uh, that was on the PlayStation Portable and PlayStation Vita. And it's also on smartphones. And it's kind of like Tetris, but it's, it's, it's also set to music, and it's very zen-like. Um, the more I play it, the more I allow myself to unwind and think. 
And what's really cool about um, Luminesce in particular is that it seems to activate this mechanical part of my mind and keep it focused. And so the rest of my mind can kind of unwind and begin thinking about things. Whenever I have a deep problem, Luminesce is the game I turn to. But there are many other games that are very good for this kind of meditative quality. And I've even been able to achieve this with uh, shooting games like Quake 2 or with other games that are just very mechanical and that don't involve a lot of thought other than just making sure I'm going to the places I need to go and doing the things that I need to do. Games can actually be a really positive form of meditation. Number three, using games as a reward system. Now, there's been a lot of talk about gamification over the last few years, and gamification is kind of a silly concept in my opinion. And let me just show you an example of one gamification system that is out there right now. Has anybody gone to Qdoba recently? They had this really simple and great reward system. It was you buy 10, 10 entrees, you get an 11th one free. And they decided to get rid of that and replace it with this ridiculously complex system where you go up in levels and the more you go to Qdoba, the higher your level and tier and the more rewards you get and the more things you can unlock. It's crazy. And um, sorry if anybody here really likes it, but I think it's, it's really difficult to understand and to, to follow. That's a bad application of gamification. Gamification is the idea of taking the principles of video games and applying them to life to make things more interesting or exciting. I tried to do gamification in my own life. I bought some rewards for myself, and I made some goals, and I achieved all those goals and got all the rewards, and I was like, this is silly. I'm not actually doing anything that useful. And some of the goals I wanted to achieve, I never did, and the rewards are still sitting in a closet waiting to be given to me because I decided to go and do something different. But what you can do is you can use games as a short-term reward. I often use them during my work day. I have some coffee break games installed on my computer, things like desktop dungeons that I can just go, okay, I'm going to work for 50 minutes, and then I'm going to play five minutes of desktop dungeons. And that gives me something to focus on because I really, really don't want to work. It gives me something to focus on so I can go, okay, at least I get to do something that I enjoy at the end of this work. Um, using them as a reward system for yourself is a very positive uh, way to utilize games in your daily life. Using games to socialize. So um, one of the best applications I've ever found for games is having people over and getting games out that they actually might enjoy playing as a group. And I'm not talking about games that are really competitive or games that require a high-level skill. I'm talking about games like, for example, there's, a, there's a, a package called the Jackbox Party. There's a few of these. And what they involve is that everybody logs in with their cell phones and they can play all these different games. Some involve drawing, some involve trivia, things like that. The learning curve for the games is very low. The, uh, the quality of the games is very high, and you can have a lot of people play at once. It's really fun. It's a really great activity for people, even if they don't enjoy gaming. But even games like Super Smash Brothers or Mario Kart or things like that, games that are kind of silly or games that are kind of weird, are great opportunities to socialize with other people. And they can make what seems like a very closed-off activity something that is very open and very acceptable and interesting to people that you've invited over. Finally, using games to curb cravings. So there was a study that came out that found that people that are suffering with intense cravings or addiction can play three or more minutes of Tetris and see a reduction in those cravings or, or, or that desire for that addiction. Tetris, of all things. This is a really interesting study. And what was, what was most interesting about it was that that effect did not wear off. So they could continue to use it throughout the day and continue to get pretty much the same gain. Something about focusing on that game for a few minutes and, and lining blocks up and putting them in lines made them feel less of a need for cravings for food, cigarettes, drugs, sex, all kinds of other things because they were playing Tetris. I think that there are other games that probably can be generalized to this, but if you don't have Tetris installed on your smartphone, and that was how they played it in this study, make sure you install it and have that ready just in case you are uh, dieting or trying to cut down on smoking or things like that. This is a good way to help curb those cravings. Finally, let me just close with one more story. This is a quick one. Years ago, I was working at, a video, at the video game store, and I had an epiphany that completely changed how I saw video games and the purpose of gaming in our lives. And it was, as you can see up here on the screen, games are supposed to be fun. And let me say that again. Games are supposed to be fun. And I say this because when I was working in the video game store, I saw a lot of people that had gotten confused about that. And when I was a games journalist, likewise. I found that a lot of gamers get caught up in the minutia of what gaming is and what the industry that makes games does. And I've had friends who have gotten so into it that they've done really crazy things, like canceling social plans so they can be in a raid on World of Warcraft, or people that have played their favorite games so compulsively that they come to hate them. They don't want to play them anymore. 
I've known people who have spent far too much of their money collecting games that they'll never play or spent too much money buying stuff in games that they'll never use in other people who refuse to play anything new because they're so stuck in only being able to appreciate the old. And I've also known people who refuse to play games because they think they're a waste of time or they're just for kids or that they'll be marked if they play games with some sort of social stigma that identifies them as not taking their adult life seriously enough. And all of those folks, in my view, are missing out because they're focusing on the activity rather than on the behavior itself. The way that I use games is I use them to augment my life, to make, make my life more fun, to make my life more exciting. I play them with my kids, I play them with my friends, I play them for entertainment. I don't let them run my life, but I'm certainly interested in them. And if you do what I do and use games as a tool to let your mind unwind, to, to give yourself a boost in happiness, to, to help you get motivated to exercise or to get your work done, you'll realize so much of the joy of gaming doesn't come from what you get out of them, but what you're willing to bring into them. And if you can channel your desire to have fun and be a better person in the act of playing games, I promise you're going to come away with what's more than a hobby that kills a few hours on an evening or a weekend. It's going to help you to be happier, healthier, and better equipped for all those other challenges that you'll face here in reality. So thank you. And I guess I'll turn things over if you have any questions.